Welcome to a special evening uh, again. This evening we have uh, with us Nan Cohan, who is going to be talking about uh, her really wonderful new book called Thinking About Leadership. And what better idea to have her think about leadership with people from across the university, since obviously leadership is an issue that uh, goes far beyond uh, the remarkable experiences that Nan has had as, as the presidents of, uh, of Wellesley and, and at Duke, and her now as, as she's a professor at Princeton. Uh, she's also a member of the Harvard Corporation, as we'll hear more about. But it is extraordinarily important that people think about leadership in many different spheres. And so the fact that we have with us, for example, David Gergen, who is the head of the Center for Public Leadership, uh, Nitin Noria, who is the new dean of the business school, and uh, Monica Higgins from the School of Education, I think is a reflection both of the power of the ideas that you're about to hear, but also the importance in the larger uh, framework. So let me just say uh, a couple of things. I first of all want to recognize that Drew Faust is with us tonight, um, who is the president of Harvard University. And uh, I'd also like to extend a welcome to, are there other members of the Harvard Corporation here? No, nope. Mark Goodhart, who helps steer them through this, uh, these, their treacherous waters is here and so forth. Now my last job is simply to introduce David Gergen, uh, which I will do quickly. As I mentioned, he's the director of the Center for Public Leadership, uh, and he's a professor of public service here at the Kennedy School. He's certainly one of our most visible and well-known uh, figures, as he has uh, seen frequently on CNN and other settings. But his remarkable uh, history of service, having served for four presidents, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Clinton, he is asked for advice by even the most recent president, and many others. He began his career in journalism, uh, becoming an editor of US News and World Report. Um, and he joined the Kennedy School uh, faculty in January uh, 1999. Um, he's the, uh, in the fall of 2000, he wrote a bestseller called Eyewitness to Power, The Essence of Leadership, Nixon to Clinton. He's engaged in many, many external activities. He cares about everything from social entrepreneurship to leadership and everything in between, but most importantly, he cares about making the world better. And I think he sees leadership as one of the most powerful tools that are available. So without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to David Gergen, and he will introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, David. Thank you all, one and all. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. I failed to I failed to hold up this lovely book, uh, <laughs> which is Nan's book, Thinking About Leadership. Good. Thank you. Thank you, David. We have uh, another introduction, set of introductions. Uh, we have been blessed in the past uh, by the presence of David's lovely wife, Marilyn. But this is the first time, to my knowledge, that we also have David's mom and his sister here. Could you all, all three, come? Please stand up. Please, all three of you, stand up if you would. <clears throat> And his sister is a graduate of this school. It's terrific. Small world. And I might add, we do have one more member of the corporation here, sitting immediately to my left, uh, who is the occasion for this evening tonight. Nan uh, has just completed this book, and, and I have my copy. You should have yours. I would urge you, all of us who had a chance to be uh, reading this, uh, I think have found an enormously insightful uh, and, a, and a great pleasure to read, as Joe Nye has written on the back of the book. It's, 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 it's one of these books about leadership that's both thoughtful and accessible, and that's not always uh, the case. But uh, I think many of you, well, maybe you don't know enough about Nan. So let me say just a few words and introduce the other two panelists, and then we're going to come back to Nan to have a, a, a conversation about the book uh, and to give her a chance to tell you more about it, and then we're going to have some follow-up. But... Uh, Nan brings something very unique to a book about leadership. She's the only person I know who is a, a political theorist, a political philosopher, uh, who is a distinguished scholar, was taught at Swarthmore, University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, uh, uh, but while teaching and pursuing a, what, what appeared to be a career uh, in teaching and scholarship, uh, her alma mater called on her out of the blue and asked her to be president of Wellesley College. Uh, so she moved into a position of leadership, and she then spent 23 years 
and university leadership positions. First at Wellesley, where she had a very, very successful run, uh, and then uh, Duke came calling and recruited her to come south, uh, where she went, and she had another extremely successful run. I'm, I'm personally acquainted with that because my, my family uh, comes from that community, and uh, I had a chance to see her in action, and I can just tell you she was enormously admired uh, by faculty and by students and just lifted the quality of that university as she did Wellesley. So it was, uh, it, it, it was a sad loss for Duke when she left, but she said, then came and lent, has lent a lot of her energies here to this university as a member of the corporation. As all of you know, it's a small corporation, seven people. Uh, and she was here during the, uh, uh, the end of the summer's uh, days, those months coming in during what was a difficult time for this university, a searching time, soul searching time, and really lent an enormous, uh, I, I, watching from afar, I think that we owe her a great grant of gratitude for helping to make that transition as successful uh, as it was, and now with, uh, with Drew here as president. So uh, you, you've served three universities in leadership roles, Nan, that we're, we're, for which we're grateful. But to think that she wrote the book from a perspective of someone who had studied Machiavelli, who teaches Plato, uh, who teaches Max Weber, and then also has had this experience of, of all the time and, and, and uh, both in the trenches and trying to shape a, a modern university. That brings something very special to this book, and I think that you'll hear more about that. A, a moment uh, for Noria to her left. Uh, so many of us are so thrilled that he has become the 10th dean of the business school. Uh, he is, uh, we knew Netany here at the Kennedy School as someone who is not only a scholar, some what, 16 books edited or co written or co-authored, uh, over time, I teach one of them in a course on leadership. Uh, for, I teach one of the students learn from it. Let me put it, I don't teach it very well, but they learn from it. Uh, the, um, uh, but any event, but Nitton was also a great in this university uh, and worked with the Kennedy School, with the School of Education, School of Public Health, uh, before he became dean and trying to advance our understanding of leadership, trying to help shape the students of the future, starting a variety of programs. I got to know him through that, uh, through that uh, set of activities. And uh, Nitin, it is a, uh, having heard the rave reviews that are coming from your early months, I, I think you've already become one of Drew Faust's distinguished appointments. Uh, and uh, we, we welcome you uh, here to uh, this uh, school, and we hope that you will visit us uh, often. We would love to see more of you. Uh, here. Uh, and to his left is Monica Higgins. Uh, and uh, Nitton made a transition from being an academic to a leadership role. Monica has made a transition while here at Harvard from teaching at the business school where she came in 19, uh, 1998, you came to the business school? Five. 1995, sorry. 1995 she came to the business school. Uh, she had done a lot of consul corporate consulting before that. She has a whole string of degrees. Uh, I, I keep telling students, you know, that uh, of, of, of Jane Adams talking about the snare of preparation, that you can get too many degrees, but you're right on the edge. You must have five or six degrees. Um, the, uh, uh, but I, I want to say she was she was a rising star at the business school, and then uh, Kathy McCartney at the at the Ed School said, you know, we're starting a new program on leadership a PhD program on leadership, we need someone really strong to be the bulwark for that program, and they recruited Monica to come over to the Ed School, where she, she too is getting rave reviews for a class I hear from her students. Um, but it's, uh, but she's been, all three of these people then have been thinking a lot about leadership from a variety of perspectives. With that as background, uh, Nan, to you, tell us about your book. Uh, tell us you know, about your central conclusions, I, I, and I, maybe I'd like to pursue one or two issues. But thank you for being here. This started in part because you came to this forum a few years ago. I remember you gave this lecture here right. in this forum about, uh, about leadership after coming off your experience at Duke, wasn't it? You know, I'm, I'm very well aware of the, the power of this forum, and it's the kind of place, it's such an honor to be sitting on this stage and, and, and remembering all the people who have spoken here, all the great conversations and debates and discussions that have taken place with some of them sort of resonating around the ceiling. So I'm really honored to be here and grateful to all of you for coming. And I look forward very much to the conversation. As, as uh, David said, th th this book had its genesis most immediately in a lecture that I gave on leadership right here in February 2005, after I had left the presidency of Duke and had gone to Stanford on sabbatical 
to retool myself as a scholar and turn to the study of leadership, this was the first place I sort of came out as a scholar of leadership, and a very appropriate place it was. Let me just say a word about the longer term genesis of the book in addition to the seeds that were planted that evening. As I, I just mentioned, I had a wonderful session for an hour with members of the Center for Public Leadership Fellowship groups and faculty members and staff. And in thinking about the longer term reasons for writing this book, I, I, re, I reminded them that, um, or I told them and reminded myself that one reason that I accepted the presidency of my alma mater, Wellesley, in 1980-81 was that I was curious about what it feels like to be a leader, curious about what it feels like to have power. I was a student of political science, a trained political philosopher. I'd always loved teaching political philosophy and I've now loved getting back to it. But I was somewhat curious about what does it feel like from the inside? Because most political scientists study leadership from the outside. We look at those guys or those gals up there with all this power and we try to figure out what they're doing and how to constrain them so they won't misbehave and hurt all the rest of us. But very few political scientists have ever had any experience on the other side of the desk of what it's like to be the president of an institution or to have the opportunity of leadership. So my goal in taking the job at Wellesley, in addition to many other much more lofty reasons, was to think about what I, what I might learn as a as a president, as a practitioner, so that I could someday write a book about leadership through the lens of a trained political philosopher, but honed by the experience of having some power, having leadership experience for 23 years. So I didn't know it would be 23 years at the outset, but after the 23 years, I came back and indeed have written the book, and the book is the fruit of that experience. So I guess the easiest way to describe it in a nutshell is it is a way of bringing theory and practice together in a very deliberate fashion. It is not a book of memoirs. I'd be very bad at writing memoirs because I have a pretty poor memory. There are anecdotes scattered throughout, maybe three or four, about my experiences on one campus or another. But it's mostly a, a, a guide, a sort of having an explorer help you go through unfamiliar terrain, a guide who's been there a few times before and is helping you understand it, therefore, from the perspective of some knowledge of it. That's the way I often think about it. And I enjoy talking with people who are making these journeys where I feel perhaps my guidance might be helpful to them, but it's very much bringing together the, the knowledge and the practitioner, the theory and the experience. I, I do also use anecdotes, and here I will switch for a moment to methodology because one of my models for this book, since I am a political theorist, was Machiavelli's Prince. Now that doesn't mean I agree with everything Machiavelli says in Prince, certainly. But I learned from his format, because as those of you who have read The Prince will recall, he uses examples of people who would have been familiar to his readers. People like Cesare Borgia, or um, Achilles, or Hannibal, or Louis XII of France. Most of us require footnotes for those folks today, but his readers would not have. They would have been household names, and so he didn't have to give long bios. He didn't have to do full-scale case studies. He could say, all right, as you know, Cesare Borgia did. So I did something of the sort by choosing six leaders that I found fascinating, that I admired, but not admired only because they were persons without flaws, and that I had learned from their leadership, and I found it useful to repeat several times through the course of the book, things I would have learned from them and hope I could pass on to my readers. The six, well, M Nelson Mandela, whom I admire tremendously. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, whom I also admire, but in a more measured way, because he wasn't quite as, as, as exalted a person in many ways. Lyndon Johnson, flawed person from, from whose leadership I learned, but also Abraham Lincoln, Margaret Thatcher, and Elizabeth I of England. Now you can say, that's a really odd set. <laughs> but they are all leaders that almost all my readers will recognize, and that you will see, you will know something probably about what they've done. Now it may make it sound as though the book is all about heads of state, which it's not. It's a book which is about leadership in many different contexts and at all kinds of, quote, levels. But when I was gonna give examples of leadership, I thought it was easier to do it for people who would be familiar to my readers. 
One of the main points that I try to make in the book is that leadership is a human activity that is very widely pervasive in any society and community. So I'm not just writing about visible, powerful heads of state. And I do define leadership early in the book. Some people write about leadership without ever getting around to define it. But I decided it was important to do that. And my definition in chapter one is this. Leaders define or clarify goals for a group, meaning a, a specific group, not just as random mass. Leaders define or clarify goals for a group, which can be as small as a, as a seminar or as large as a nation state or larger. Define and clarify goals for a group and mobilize the energies of members of the group to pursue those goals. Now you'll notice it doesn't say anything about whether the goals are good or bad. It doesn't say anything about whether the goals are shared or imposed, but it is defining and mobilizing. And then if you define it that way, you can see that people in all kinds of situations provide leadership. And as I point out, you can do everything from Cub Scout troop masters to a warlord, a warlord in Afghanistan, the CEO of IBM, or the head of a government agency, or somebody who's presiding over a garden club, or organizing a book group. We think of leadership in all those contexts. A gang on a playground. So then you might say, well, they seem to have so little in common. How, how do you use the same word for all those phenomena, those activities? And here I use a, a, a concept from Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein that I find very helpful. He was trying to figure out why do we use the same word game to describe so many different human practices, ball games, card games. He, he didn't know about video games. He would have added those too. We use the same term, but they seem like such different things. And his answer was, they don't have any single thing in common, but they have family resemblances. As when we look at members of a family and we can see some of the ways in which their eyes or their mouths or their smiles or whatever have something in common that is a little hard and elusive to define. And he said leadership is, he said games are like that. I'm saying leadership is like that. There are family resemblances. And teasing them out is one of the main purposes of the book. So the last thing I'll say before we bring our colleagues here is a very brief word about the structure of the book. It starts with this chapter on what leaders do, definition of leadership, and how leaders actually behave, what they spend their time doing. The second chapter is on leaders and followers, because I believe that it's very important to recognize the interactions among leaders and followers if you're going to understand leadership. Your own colleague, Barbara Kellerman, has written a great book about that, from which I learned a lot. The third chapter is about traits and skills that leaders may find helpful in a variety of circumstances. I certainly don't believe that all leaders are born with a definable set of traits that we all either recognize or they're not there. But it is certainly true that in almost any one of the varied kinds of behaviors I described, certain kinds of traits and skills can turn out to be useful to leaders in many different contexts. The fourth chapter is about gender. Does gender make a difference? Do women lead differently from men? The fifth chapter is about democracy. What are the special challenges or opportunities of leading in a democracy? And the final chapter, which I thought about titling, Does Power Corrupt? And then thought that that was a little too simplistic, is about how character and ethics and leadership interact. So those are the six chapters of the book. I'm delighted to be here with so many leaders in the audience, on the stage, glad to recognize my colleague Kathy McCartney, Dean of the School of Education, among many other folks here who are leaders. And I look forward to what you all have to say. Now, let me follow up if I might. Uh, uh, the question that goes to one of your, one of your chapters. Uh, Barbara Tuckman, the historian in her book, The March of Folly, uh, traces the efforts uh, over centuries, uh, both for theorists and then for practitioners, to try to prepare people for governance of a society. How, do, how can we successfully prepare people to govern a society well? She looks back to Plato, but she looks at the Mandarins and the Chinese, she looks at the Turks and the Janissaries, she looks at the Prussians, and she concludes that all of these efforts have sort of come for naught to, to a certain degree, that corruption, ambition have intruded. Uh, and, and, her, and her final conclusion is that in institutions, and I, I raise this in the context of Harvard, that in institutions like this, we ought to prepare people to be leaders of character. That if one can get that right, a lot of other things flow from it. 
you wrote a chapter about the dangers of uh, a, a power, how it can derail people. Help us understand what can we do in a university setting uh, to, and I know, and, and this is something that, that I want to turn to you on, this is something we wrestle with in our schools. Well, I, I would argue that if we're going to try to train people to be leaders, thinking about building character is an important part of it. But I would back up for a minute and, and, and remind us that you also learn about leadership from being exposed to examples of people who have done it, either people you listen to, meet, or read about. And that one of the questions that a good teacher of leadership will have the students be conscious of is, what does this, what does this person's performance experience, flaws, failures and mistakes. Tell me about this person's character. What were the strengths that someone like Franklin Roosevelt brought to the presidency? And where were his character flaws, perhaps, getting in his way, whether it was the way he handled information or was a little bit um, devious in some ways? And so using examples is one good way in which you may get people to think about character. And then having opportunities themselves to take on leadership experiences and learn more about their own character strengths and weaknesses through figuring out if I make mistakes, why did I do that, and what can I learn from it? But I think the most important answer to your question is there has to be a mood in the community that character in the sense of integrity or a sense of personal responsibility for your life and your activities is an important part of what makes you a leader and makes you able to contribute to others. And thinking you're going to be a leader without reflecting on your character, deepening your character, and building on your mistakes and your successes is very short-sighted. Do you think then that we ought to, uh, I, I remember once uh, Drew Faust coming here to give a lecture about leadership, and you talked about Lincoln, but did you said in the history profession, there had been a movement away from teaching much about leadership. It was, it was, there, there, the emphasis has changed. And so uh, there is a sense, some have, that the academy no longer wants to talk very much about role models, that that's not a, that's not a popular way to, to do scholarship uh, or to think about people. But I, but I think I hear you saying that, that young people need role models. They need people they can fashion themselves after, as well as to understand where some people go wrong. Well, certainly different discipline taught in different ways. I would find it impossible to think about how you would teach leadership without looking at examples of leaders and talking about why they did what they did, where they succeeded, where they failed, and why. I don't see how you could do it. And therefore, um, teaching about character is something that seems to me likely to come up. Yeah. Nitin, you've, you've, you've <laughs> thought about these questions now. You've, uh, as, you, as you move from scholar to leader, uh, but the business school has been wrestling with these questions going all the way back to Jeff Skilling uh, and, you know, uh, and his sort of famous statement at the business school, allegedly, as a student, uh, saying his role in life was to go out and make as much money as he could, and it was the role of other people to try to catch him. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just curious how, how now you've, been, you've really brought to the business school an emphasis now on ethics. Uh, and, and what the place, and Michael Porter just wrote this important piece in the Harvard Business Review about it. I'm just curious from your perspective now, how, what role Harvard, what role the business school should play in the preparation of business leaders who are, who are ethical? So, you know, I, uh, one of the things that I've reflected at great length about is the mission of Harvard Business School. Right. So our mission is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And it's a high-sounding mission, and everybody can uh, relate to it. But as you rightly point out, uh, there are people who say, well, you know, how do you account for the Jeff Skillings of the world, who certainly don't seem to exemplify uh, this mission that uh, you so proudly announce? Uh, so one of the things I've started to do and in all kinds of conversations I have, both with our students, uh, but also with the faculty, is to try and uh, unpack this mission and to say, what do we mean by each of these words? Uh, so when we use the word leaders, what do we actually mean? And reading Nan's book was an extraordinarily instructive exercise because uh, I guess it's always instructive when, when someone writes something that uh, resonates with you. Uh, but I certainly had that feeling reading the book because I have said that you know, we must 
recognize that leaders are not people who can declare themselves to be leaders. Uh, leaders are people that others have to call leaders. And if all we are in the business of doing at Harvard Business School is to educate people who self-declare themselves to be leaders because they assume some position of power, that's hardly the kind of leader we should be impressed or excited about educating. That what we should care about is people who are declared leaders by others because they enjoy a special competence uh, or a special character. And I can't think of anybody who is declared a leader by anybody else unless they possess both competence and character. So I don't think it's just enough to, in fact, have people of character. I think it's actually very important to make sure that you also cultivate competence. In fact, Nan, Nan writes in her book that leadership is often a stream of decisions. If you make a series of bad decisions, uh, even if you're a person of great character, I can assure you nobody's going to call you a leader. So it's quite important for us to think hard about both cultivating the competencies that we want that allow people to make a series of good decisions over time, recognizing that it's not easy to make perfect decisions all the time, uh, and also to cultivate a, a deep sense of character so that people, uh, you know, as one of my faculty members said, let's at least make sure that uh, people understand our mission to educate leaders who make a positive difference in the world. Uh, because sometimes people have accused our leaders of making a negative difference in the world. Uh, and cultivating this imagination, which is how can you as a leader bring yourself through a combination of competence and character to make a positive difference in the world, is one of the things that we're beginning to have lots of conversations about. Uh, what we're learning is that in terms of questions of character, which is what uh, you were talking about, David, it's, uh, it, it's a hard thing for people to confront the fallibility of their character. I'll, I'll give you an example. I used to teach a course called Leadership and Corporate Accountability, in which we had people review the results of the Milgram experiments. Uh, and, and you know, you would show people, we would show people the videotape, and we would give them the data that 90% of the people in these experiments would be willing to give shocks to people that were close to killing them off. And then we'd ask people, how many of you think that if you were in that situation, you would do the same thing? And what was remarkable is that despite being presented the evidence that 90% of the people who included doctors and scientists and people, business people, people exactly like them, less than a third of the students would ever admit huh. that they would be capable of engaging in the same acts as we told them 90% of the people randomly chosen would do. Uh, so it's hard to get people to confront the question of how, when they are put in situations, situations of power, situations of authority, situations of temptation, uh, their own sense of character may in fact fail them. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to now, through personal narrative, through examples where we ask people to excavate their own life stories where they may have been lost, trying to get people to in fact reflect more deeply on those moments where their character that they felt so sure, of, felt so sure about, uh, they may not in fact have acted in a way that was as sure as they felt that they would be. Uh, so cultivating character is turning out to be one of the most difficult things that we can think about. Uh, on the matter of competence, I think we have made more progress. Uh, but this is a deep question. Do you, it sounds as if you're moving away uh, uh, to, to a certain degree from the case study method as being the heart and soul. I mean, still obviously critically important, but that you're experimenting with some other ways of teaching. So we think that the, what the case study method did, which we were so good at, is in fact uh, train people to do exactly, uh, to think about decision making on an ongoing basis, right? So the heart of a good case is that you confront people with a real decision. And you get them to recognize that there is no right answer in any given situation. So judgment, which is a very important part of what Nan talks about in her book, is in fact what we thought the real core of the case method was about by looking at 500 cases and having the opportunity to think about these decisions in terms of how you would decide in these circumstances yourself, but not just how you would decide yourself, but how others in that circumstance might decide differently. Uh, when you talk to our alumni 10, 15, 20 years later, what they remember the case method for is a process that was fabulous, fabulous at cultivating judgment, which I think is a vital competence that leaders must have. I think this question of character uh, and to probe more deeply into character might require a different kind of venue uh, than the naked exposure that you have in a class of 90 students. I think, and you're gonna, yeah. Monica, if you could hold just one minute. Yeah. I, I agree 
with about 90% of what you just said. I certainly think that training leaders who have had attention paid to both their competence and their character is a much better way to go about it than neglecting either one. So I'm sure that you're training better leaders than you would if you didn't. But I'm, I'm nervous about the notion that character in an admirable sense is a building block of leadership because I, I would distinguish, as a colleague Joe Nye does in his book, between two different senses of good. Good as competent, a good leader as competent leader, and a good leader who is pursuing morally worthy goals, and we might say someone of sterling character. And I'm of the view that there are leaders who are quite effective who pursue horrific goals. I mean, uh, there's a lot of discussion in the leadership literature about this. Was Hitler a leader? And people, James McGregor Burns would say, no, he can't be a leader because Carl he was making, making, exactly, making people's lives worse. I, I would disagree. I think Hitler, particularly in the early years of his Fuhrership, was a very effective leader, but for horrific goals, really. But it would be hard to say that he was a bad leader in the sense of incompetent, or that he wasn't a leader, because by my definition at least, he was defining goals and mobilizing people to pursue them. So I tend to, I tend to emphasize more the neutral qualities of leadership. I think of judgment as very important, but I think of judgment as a neutral factor that can be used in a number of different ways. So I, I hear what you're saying, and the position that you're taking is, I'm sure, better for teaching. But in terms of de defining leadership, I'm not sure I agree. Uh, and I wouldn't disagree with you in terms of the definition. Uh, but what we're trying to do is to educate leaders. And as I think about that act of education, I think having a moral purpose is a vital part of education. So you should not, I certainly think you should teach and educate with a sense of uh, neutrality so that people can understand uh, in a positive sense what leadership is. Uh, and and posi by positive, I, I mean here, in a scientific positive sense. And this is just the description of how you would want to define leadership. But I think beyond that, we must animate our students with a, a, a deeper sense of what their calling as leaders might be and how do they plan to go out in their lives and conduct themselves as leaders. And in that sense, at least, uh, what we are finding is that encouraging them to have a deeper question or a deeper sense of their own character as leaders, which will inform their purpose as leaders, which will inform how they will respond in different situations, making them recognize the fallibility that you so vividly point out in your book that once you get power, uh, you may be a different person. And just be open to that possibility. Uh, and if you think that you're not gonna be, then you're actually being naive. Uh, these are the kinds of questions that we hope that our students will learn. And uh, for the longest time, I don't think we did enough to help them think about this. And I'm not sure that our 90 person case method classrooms are necessarily the best ways to do it. And that's why, David, we're trying to think about other ways in which we can put students in settings uh, where they, they're capable of being more vulnerable in a smaller group, maybe with six or eight people, mm -hmm. uh, so that they can turn to have these conversations that allow themselves to not just feel like I'm infallible, but to recognize that uh, fallibility is, in fact, very much the character and quality of any leader. And knowing that fallibility and knowing how to overcome it is in fact the mark of a good leader. Monica, you've, you've now gone to the uh, School of Education. Uh, you all have started a, a doctoral program in leadership. Uh, you had an unbelievable number of applications the first year for 25 spots. Hardest, I'm not sure what the admissions rate, but it may be tougher than getting into Harvard undergrad. I'm not sure I with, with the numbers. Uh, but but uh, uh, t from your point of view, as, you, as you've launched this program, Dean McCartney's here, uh, t tell us about, reflect if you would, uh, overall, but if you could come back to this question about uh, teaching people competence, and I love the phrase, cultivating character. Yeah. So I was listening to this, and I was thinking, you know, as somebody who's come from business background primarily and then moved into the sector, so now I've been in education for four years, and what's different about this sector, and therefore, how does that make a difference in terms of, of how we teach or help people learn, I should say, how to become effective leaders? And there are some differences. You know, I was kind of, I was um, thinking, you know, here I'm a student of organizational behavior, I'll come over, and 
you know, people are saying it's different, different, and actually, you know, there are some different pieces to it, to this sector. So I just want to point those out because turning the prism a little bit might also add to the conversation maybe some other elements of leadership as well. So when I think about, and I'm going to be talking primarily from pre-K-12, mm -hmm. so as opposed to higher ed. So I think there are some differences. Most of my research is in large urban, so New York and Chicago and so forth. So when I think about that, um, you know, there are so many, so many stakeholders involved in getting your good work done as a leader that some of the things that I think we almost take for granted when you're at the top of an organization or at the top of a university, you know, that you have legitimacy and there's this asymmetry between the followers and leaders that grants you power and there's certain expectations and so forth. In these kinds of settings, I mean, a formal authority, that's everything but formal authority. And we kind of say that in business, but in education, it's so much the case that actually a lot of what leaders do is um, building that legitimacy. That's a lot of what they need to do. So when I think about what does it take to be able to build that, um, build that community, build that followership so that you can get and I shouldn't say your good work done, their good work done, because my goodness, the people who are closest to the customer, the students, we know from the research, that those are the people you need to listen to. You don't have all the answers, so actually you making the decision is almost a different paradigm shift as well. So I've started thinking about leadership as different than making decisions and problem solving. I've started thinking about it as creating the conditions in organizational systems or settings so that people can do their best work. And that's a more, that's another C, it's kind of creating capacity in a system. In large systems, you know, are the ones that I'm thinking about, but certainly small systems too. But in kind of this sort of environment where the problems of the achievement gap, for example, are just pernicious, I mean, how are you going to address this? You need folks who are closest to the, closest to the customer to make to help you make those good decisions. So it's creating capacity. So if I translate that, you know, and then think about, well, how do we develop leaders who have character and competence and the capacity themselves to create capacity in others? Um, then this new leadership degree program, we're really, we are, we're really looking at a different way of teaching and learning about leadership. So, um, I'm a firm believer in the case method. That's how I grew up. Um, so certainly we, we, you know, we certainly like putting students in the position of trying to think through and exercise judgment and problem solve and, and that sort of thing. But we're actually also trying to figure out ways to get students out in the midst of these messy problems in practice. So our model is now, um, it's partially a residency model. Partly, I... A residency model. So we have the first year is a required curriculum, the second year there are elective courses across the university, and then the third year you work out in, whether it's a district or whether it's, you know, some other kind of organization, we really want to kind of have, um, you know, students who are out in all the places where there may be exciting change going on in the sector, so it might be a technology company, and you're out there for your third year and you're doing a capstone project and you come back, and you're really engaging and actually taking on real work like a medical model, medical school model. So that's a very different way of developing leadership. You, you see that more as something that's it's more effective at the graduate level that, than, than you would recommend it for the undergraduate level? So which aspect of it? The uh, getting out in the field uh, uh, and uh, having the practice. I like the idea of getting out in the field and having practice, period. Yeah, generally. So, generally Regardless. speaking, yeah, I, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. But you need to have some through line. You know, you need to either right. have some way of, in this case, we have a cohort. So the cohort yeah. will yeah. come back together and so forth. But this is not unlike but, what medical schools do, too. Is yeah. I mean, there's an enormous yeah. amount of time spent in the hospitals. Right, absolutely. On the rounds. Right, right. So, and so that and, is and part of And turning your judgment through, through being actually exactly. being in, in the experience. Exactly. And you're watching, certainly, your role modeling. We want to make sure, back to that earlier comment about role models, we want to make sure that there's a system of mentors in the organizations that we place these students right. in so that, you know, we really, you know, we're just not kind of placing them in some large district without the follow-up. Right. Then you seem to be about ready to jump in. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, one, one distinction that we have, a uh, colleague of ours, uh, Scott Snook makes, and you know Scott well, is yeah. uh, this distinction between, uh, that came from the army between knowing, doing, and being, and how all three are quite important to the development of leaders. And we're all very good in universities in, in the knowing part of this. We can cram people to the gills with, as we do, 500 cases, and uh, you, know, you can always add more. And the question is, uh, lots of people have talked about this huge knowing-doing gap, especially when it comes to leadership, that what you know about leadership is not mm. the same as translating it into something that you then can do. And then beyond that, the distinction, you know, first you have to learn how to do, but you also have, it's a question of being. There's a whole identity yeah. uh, of being a leader, uh, which is a more, yet another gear to learn about. And it's very hard to, in fact, learn anything about being without doing, right? So doing might be a necessary access to, in fact, learn a lot about being a leader. So I'm quite struck by what Monica is talking about. I think that that's a great model. And part of what we're trying to, in fact, ask ourselves at the business school is can we, while the students are there for two years, also encourage cycles in which people learn how to yeah. translate knowing into doing and through the doing actually understand what it means themselves yeah. almost. Yeah, David Elwood is encouraging that conversation here at the Kennedy School. He's, he's initiated a set of conversations in, in, a, in a parallel way. Yeah, Monica, are you going to jump back in? I'm going to go back to Nan for yeah. a second. Go ahead. Please. I, I just wanted to pause on the issue of knowing and doing. Because our conversation so far has been very much about teaching leadership. And that's one of the things that you do here and do right. very well. And I'm enjoying very much teaching MPAs and MPPs at the Woodrow Wilson School. But I think that the really tricky part is scholarship about leadership. I think it's easier in some ways to think about how to teach people to lead than it is to make sure we understand what leadership is. And the book, the things that I'm wrestling with the book, I mean, I do talk about teaching in a few paragraphs at the end, but what I'm really interested in is trying to figure out, so what is leadership? How do we understand it? Because I don't, it, it's, it, it's it, there's so many different ways of looking at that, that I, and defining leadership and, and probing it. So I, I want to, I'm not sure how much we know about leadership. Now, maybe... We don't need to know a lot in a theoretical sense in order to be able to teach people yeah. to do it. Yeah. But I just but, don't know that we have this great body of knowledge and the problem is to translate it into doing. I don't know about the body of knowledge. But so it's interesting, that, but, but your definition is about clarifying goals and then mobilizing the group, the followers, right. Right. And, and to, to pursue those goals. And what I think I heard Monica saying was your, your, her, her structure is much more about empowering others and letting them figure out how to get things, how to get work done. Right, it's creating the capacity in the system so that people can do their best work and yes, you and they together need to figure out what to do. That doesn't mean it's purely entirely collaborative. I mean, there are times when leaders need to take decisions and, and you know, have a more bold approach. But I think that the, the model, at least, I was kind of trying to think about pre-K-12 and this kind of pyramid model, at least the more progressive districts have really shifted to invert the pyramid. So really thinking about, say, again, I'm, I'm thinking about education, but just to provide a contrast, that the central office is more of even a service organization, that the answers are out there. So as opposed to kind of problem solving and, you know, kind of cajoling people along or bringing people along, that it's really about trying to figure out how to create the conditions so that we learn together. And it's a different, I, I just think it's, it's a slightly different angle on it. But it sounds like you all both are at a, at a sort of more sophisticated level of complexity in thinking about this than I'm trying to pitch, at, at least at the beginning of the book. I start with an example of a homeless community in Providence, Rhode Island. It's sort of rough form of democracy, but they also have a chief who basically tells people where to pitch their tents and keeps people from breaking out in fights and so forth. And some people say, so why are you bossing everybody around? And so he immediately steps back and says, you know, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then fights break out and people steal things from everybody else's tents. And everybody comes back to him and says, we vote you back in. We want you to be chief. Now, to me, that's leadership. It's not all there is about leadership. 
but it isn't as sophisticated as you know building capacity or strengthening our character. All those things come, and they all come very importantly. But I'm trying to figure out, so what's the bare bones here that we need to understand before we get to the sophisticated parts? But, but, uh, but it, it's interesting. I, 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 somebody told me this anecdotally the other day. I did not know this. Uh, at, the, at the Federal Reserve, when, when uh, Alan Greenspan was there, and they, and they came to make a decision, and the, and the conversation would start with Alan Greenspan saying what his position was on the, the decision that was facing them, and then asking everybody else to comment. And they go all the way around. And, and Bernanke has come in with a very different view, and that is, I want each of you to speak, and then I will speak. But it's a different approach. It's a different, uh, it is, I mean, I think Alan represented more of what I would consider the more traditional school of leadership. And I think Bernanke represents a, you know, the more, I want to empower you. I want you. Maybe the best answers are out there uh, as an approach to it. Well, I actually think that Nan's book would argue that that's a very simplistic view of thinking about what's right and wrong. If I, if I read your book correctly, in fact, what, what I read in your book is to say that you know, kind of nuance and contingency and context and understanding, uh, you know, when it is right to lead from the front, when it is right to lead from the middle, when it is yeah. right to lead from behind. These are not. Uh, immutable truths. These are, uh, these are highly contextually defined. And in fact, uh, so in that sense, I think your book does a huge service by beginning to lay out, uh, you know, like I found enormously helpful highlighting three dialectics. You know, the dialectic, for example, between passion and proportion, between empathy and detachment, between courage and moderation. Uh, and I must say that you know the, they became especially germane to me now that I finally stopped being a teacher of leadership and have to do some of this stuff and have to practice it. You just suddenly realize you know, these are no longer just words. These are uh, knife-edged things to balance, and you can get them wrong so easily. And just thinking about that hard. And so in, in that sense, I think that if what you're trying to encourage with the book is an identification of some of these core basic elemental things that from we need to, from the inside, that we need to understand, you know, what, what it feels like to be yeah. a leader. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I think the book succeeded uh, very much because uh, it resonated with me as I've just made that transition. Like, it sounds like you were reading it as someone who's just taken over a business. Yeah, school. that's yeah. what I <laughs> But the, 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 the passage that, that Nathan has just mentioned, which is one of my favorite parts of the book as well, is very much inspired by Max Weber's Politics as a Vocation. And he, he talks about passion and proportion, that you need both to be deeply passionate about something as a leader. You have to care about something or you're not going to have the energy or the vision or the, the commitment to see it through. You've got to care about something or else you're, you're vexed by the curse of the creature's worthlessness, as he when puts you, it. When you or, were with students this afternoon, you said that the last 10 pages. The, the last 10 pages of, my, well, let me finish my equation. And okay. Passion on the one side, but a proportion a sense of perspective, of detachment. He said the problem is those two things don't easily come together, being hot under the collar about caring about getting something done that you're obsessed with achieving. And on the other hand, being able to step back and say, you know, wait a minute, I'm, I have some detachment from myself, from my situation, from my followers, even from my cause. And Weber's right, those two things don't easily go together. I think he's also right that really good leaders have both. So this is from as you said, the last 10 pages of Max Weber's essay, Politics as a Vocation, given as a lecture in Munich to a group of students in 1918, published in a book called uh, From Max Weber by Gerth and Mills. You don't have to get bogged down in the German bureaucratic stuff in the middle unless you really like that stuff. But the last 10 pages are the best single text I know for learning about leadership. And that was the inspiration for that passage. That actually is. Complexity. I mean, I, I saw. You're right. You're right. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of resonating with what Nitin said. I, I read the whole book as kind of, you know, understanding the situation and realizing, you know, what type of style or strategy or people on your team are appropriate for when. And that's actually, that's complicated You're right. to be able to do that. And to think about how do we teach people to do that, that's about teaching people to exercise judgment effectively. And you say that judgment is something that. Um, can be cultivated, but you begin with, I guess, a seed of it, or you know, some people have more of it than others, and then we can cultivate it. So how do you 
create the conditions to cultivate that. I guess would be one element I would add to the mix of being an effective leader is creating those opportunities. Well, I talk about almost, we all see, even in young children, some who have better judgment than others. Um, my own example would be my grandchildren. I'm blessed with a number of grandchildren. And there are a couple of them who, from the time they were seven or 10 years old, you could see that they were good at making decisions, that other people followed their lead. They showed good judgment in circumstances of emergency. Two other grandchildren, whom I love dearly, you know, sort of wander around. <laughs> I wouldn't follow them anywhere. And they have very poor judgment. But it's not that they're less good people. They may be very creative, whatever. So yeah. I think you're right. There's some seeds that are innate. But it really needs development, honing with experience, having opportunities to deepen your judgment. So both are important. I, I want to invite others into the conversation. But, but just before we do, I, 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 central to your writing and to this book was also questions about gender. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and I'm just, what, could you share with us sort of, you to use the phrase, what difference difference makes? Um, when I started to write the book and thought about the gender chapter, I, I was at one of my Wellesley College reunions. And I took advantage of the fact that there were a lot of really bright, thoughtful women there who'd gone through everything from Betty Friedan to modern girl-type feminism. And I asked every one of them that I could find in the line for the clam bake or breakfast in the dorm or whatever, I said, do women lead differently from men? And every one of them said, yes, women lead differently from men. And I was really taken aback by this, because that's not the way I would have answered the question. I would have said it's much too complicated to generalize in that way. But I was very struck that they all said that. And when I asked them, well, why, how, it was as you would expect, nurturing, more sensitive to other people, and so forth. My own take on this topic is more that certainly not all women lead alike, and they don't all lead differently from all men. The notion that all women lead alike is as ridiculous as thinking that all men lead alike. Jimmy Carter and Genghis Khan? I don't think so. <laughs> um, and why should it be true with Margaret Thatcher and Mother Teresa? It doesn't work. So that's, that, that's easy to shoot out of the water. Mar not Margaret, all Tha Margaret Thatcher and Elizabeth I. Much more common. You're right. Right. Yeah. But, but it is nonetheless true that socialization as a boy or a girl in any society is going to make some difference in the way you approach life as an um, older person, as a grown-up. And it will make a difference to the way you lead, just as it makes a difference to the way you are a friend, the way you throw a ball, the way you fall in love. And, and so socialization matters more in some societies than others when girls and boys are educated just so differently. In ours, they're sometimes educated more the same way. But the socialization by peer culture is very powerful. And it doesn't show women being aggressive and ambitious and getting up there and telling everybody what to do. That's not what popular culture says girls are supposed to do. So socialization is important. But it's not all that there is. As Sandra Day O'Connor says, we're also socialized in our professions in organizations that we lead. So it's very complicated. But the bottom line, I think, is yes, it will make a difference that you are a woman, if nothing else, because there will be stereotypes. And people expect you to do something in a particular way. And in the long run, I would hope that we would get rid of those stereotypes so that both women and men who are leading could lead in their own individually strong ways. But while the stereotypes are there, any woman leader is going to have to find her way through them, is going to have to figure out a way to navigate through them. And most of the best women leaders that I know combine some elements that you might call, quote, masculine, and some that you might call, quote, feminine, in order to find their own successful leadership styles. But it's a much more complicated question than do women lead differently from do you, men? Do you think that the best men leaders uh, have some aspects that are masculine and some, quote, some aspects that are, quote, feminine? They may. They're not required to think about that. I mean, one big difference, there's this wonderful image of the labyrinth. Alice Eagley and Linda Carley have written a book called Through the Labyrinth. And instead of talking about the pipeline or the glass ceiling, they say the real image is that women who are ambitious for leadership and want to get to the central office in the middle of the maze or the labyrinth are going to have to find their way through cul-de-sacs and past dead ends and all kinds of things that men just don't have to do. So men may, in fact, have elements of their leadership that are more stereotypically feminine or masculine, yes. But the difference is they don't generally have to stop and think about it. And nobody else is going to 
it require them to think about it by sort of pushing it in their face. Mm -hmm. And but that is different. Let's spend a couple more minutes on this, Annette, and from your, your perspective now, a growing number of women at the business school, and, and how you all think about this, and Monica, over to you on these issues. So there's a, a phrase in, in, in Nan's book that stayed with me and I thought very hard about, which is, gendered expectations are more influential than any measurable gender difference. I was sort of struck by this phrase uh, because I was trying to think about, you know, so if the other thing that we know from leadership is that the experience of being a leader is in part the experience of living in a fishbowl. You're being watched and watched, especially the more influential your role as a leader. Now, if you combine that with these expectations, then it's no surprise that, you know, people will watch very carefully for the thing that either confirms or is that, odds with? Is, that, is that odds with an expectation? And so it's almost as if the crucible of expectations becomes even more magnified because in, in the context of leadership, you're being watched so carefully and it's almost as if you're being watched though, not neutrally, you're being watched through this prism of expectations. I think that that allowed me to understand why it is that uh, women who are in leadership positions, and we've had a lot, you know, our graduates, so people on the leadership team that I've been able to assemble, feel much more acutely watched and much more self-conscious of, of what it means to be a leader. And that has all kinds of consequences. So our MBA students will say that, you know, a man can say something stupid in class and the comment dies by the time they finish class. If I say something stupid in class, I will hear that at dinner tonight from my classmates. And so this weight of how these expectations carry and what that does, you know, so they'll say, therefore, I am twice as careful about what I will say. And then in a case classroom method, you immediately recognize that people are self, you know, women are self-censoring themselves right. in terms of speaking as much as they might otherwise. So this idea that the expectations that we have and leadership is very much influenced. You know, you call someone a leader because they fit your expectations of what you expect out of a leader. So if expectations themselves are as gendered uh, as Nan rightly points out, I think it helps us understand why women in leadership positions have the difficulties that they do and why it does feel like a labyrinth, as you so rightly point out. So I was looking at my notes from reading your book and I wrote down the same quote, <laughs> <laughs> same one. Um, it does stand out that expectations really shape behavior. It's an interactive process. Um, I would add a couple of things to that. One is that it isn't about you know an individual kind of our own style, irrespective of those. We're developing a relationship with others. So when we think about um, role modeling, to go back to that, so a lot of my work was on mentoring and looking at types of networks that women tend to develop. Not women tend to develop. That wasn't my work, but there's a lot of work on this, and that women tend to develop more functionally differentiated networks. They need to reach out to more people just because there are less women generally who are in senior level positions who can provide both the career and the psychosocial support. So think about that when you think about developing leaders. That you aren't developing in isolation. It isn't about just figuring out my style and matching the situation. It's figuring about in relationship with others, how am I going to develop? And from that perspective, we do have a problem because the opportunity structure still isn't in balance, so women need to do a lot more work to get the same amount of help. They need to reach out to a lot of different corners to get the same strength of a network. So that, that's one piece. And the second piece I would say is I agree with the, you know, the, the spotlight on women in the sense that you know, I, I, I feel the weight of my comment in a meeting, et cetera, more, or in a classroom. Um, but there's also the very, very subtle differences I think, that aren't so explicit. So we also know from some research that if you change the name of the case protagonist from a man from, you know, a man's to a woman's, the rating will just go down. That's so subtle when you think yeah, about yeah. it. So if you rate, you know, how much the students like a case and you change the name of the case protagonist from John to Jane. Same case. Same Thank exact you. case. Just change the name of the case protagonist, John to Jane. It just drops in terms of the rating. It's so subtle. So 
it's not only about the spotlight. It's about all sorts of, you know, um, intangibles and, and biases that have built up over the years, I would say. Wow, that's really, really I, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. Yeah. So if you change the name of a case at the business school from an American CEO to a Chinese CEO, does the appreciation of the case go way up? <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that, but we have, I, I've actually, in, my, in a power and influence class at ICT, I, I did that. Half the class would get the case, same case. Yeah. The case protagonist was, just the name was changed to yeah. Yeah. a woman, and half the class got the same case, and they didn't know that the other half had got the case, and the case protagonist was a man. And exactly what Monica talked about would occur, which is people's assessment of the situation was quite different. And then you would have them say, but you know, so and who's the person that you're talking about? I'd use the last name right. just to kind of get the conversation going. And the last name was the same of both people. So I'd start the conversation by just using the protagonist's last name to get the conversation started. And we'd have as if two different conversations going on in the room. <laughs> and then you'd, alert, then you'd say to people, and by the way, how many of you read the cane that said Jane? And how many of you read the case that said John? And all of a sudden, there was like this aha moment in which people discovered that their reading of the case was deeply gendered just by virtue of Even the name. Nothing else, nothing else was, I mean, everything else was exactly the same in the case. Really interesting. Uh, the floor is open. There are microphones here. Uh, please join the conversation, and uh, we're going to start up here. Uh, the, 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 the Kennedy School rules, uh, uh, and Nan's dear friends with Joe and I, and Joe and I, as Joe and I always said, one per customer, and a question always ends with a question mark. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your uh, insights. I am Pukhar Malla, a second year student here at the Kennedy School and also the president of Harvard Graduate Council. My question uh, is to Nan. We talked about Hitler and how he was possibly an effective leader. And we talked about, you talked about two aspects of leadership, defining goals, and mobilizing people. So I have a, the dual in my mind is, was Hitler really able to get, get uh, feedback from his constituents in defining the goals? So in your, in your perspective, how important is getting the views of the constituents in defining the goals, uh, the way you define the core of leadership? I, th I think in any long-term good leadership, either in the definition of competent or morally worthwhile, you will not succeed unless you pay attention to what your constituents want. Hitler didn't, except for the people who were closest around him. And I think that was one of the reasons why, in the end, he didn't fail. But the second thing, I mean, he failed. The second thing had to do, though, with the mobilization. Because mobilization is a, a, a neutral word. You can mobilize people by persuading them by your rhetoric, by giving them great arguments, or you can mobilize people by cracking a whip and making them, making them obey. And I think he was, he, one of his, one of his signal failures as a leader, in any way one would want to use as an example, was that he did not reach out to his constituents. But that is true of dictators and absolute monarchs and some CEOs across the century. I mean, some people are just a lot clearer that you're going to be a better leader if you listen to other people. Aristotle said it first, a feast to which many contribute is better than one that's brought by a single person. I don't know if that's always true of food, but it certainly is true of leadership. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of evidence that you're going to make a better decision if you bring in people's perspectives and brainstorm about it than if you sit there and treat it like a Rubik's Cube. And if you just angle it long enough, it'll work. How, how do you then deal with the question, look, you've heard your, your constituents, they all want to go left. And your judgment, your intuition is to go right. Well, if you're in the end, if you're the leader, then it's your decision. I remember one very apposite example of this, where I first really realized after leading the presidency, leaving the presidency of Duke, how different it was to have power. I was heading a faculty staff committee to set up a program at Princeton that the dean was very keen on, but she'd gone on sabbatical and left me to set it up. So the faculty staff committee was made up of people who were much less clear that this was a good program, and there was a number of complaints and. One day, everybody was sort of whining. And when they left the room, I sat back in my chair and I said, you know, if I were president, I would say, thank you very much. I've heard you. 
this is what we're going to do, and everybody would go off and do it. But you can't say that as a faculty staff chair. The point is I would have listened to them carefully, but in the end, I would make the call. That's the difference between having power and not yeah, having power. Yeah. I, I heard the phrase the other, a couple of few days ago, you know, uh, with the faculty, it's like, it's like herding cats, and the trick is to know where to put the cat food. <laughs> <laughs> incentives, incentives. <Yeah. laughs> Please. Uh, good evening. My name is James Cabot. I'm a second-year MPA student. I'm also an um, MBA candidate at Columbia Business School. And um, we've heard tonight a little bit about um, leadership as a, uh, something that combines competency and character. And we've also heard about the, the knowing, being, doing model. Uh, my question is, I guess, primarily for Dean Nuri. It was sort of prompted by something you said, but it could really be for anyone. And it's about graduate education. By the time you're dealing with students who are in their mid-20s, it seems clear to me that graduate schools uh, focus on developing student com uh, competencies. But to what extent do you believe that graduate schools can help students also develop their character? Or are students simply too far along in their career for that really to be teachable? So I guess a different way of saying this is, um, should Jeff Skilling have been taught or should he have been screened out? Um, <laughs> so I actually come out in the, in the place that says that real tests of character barely even begin for most of our students. They actually have. Uh, such lack of preparation, in fact, in thinking about what the real challenges of character will be, that to assume that somehow or the other they've learned about their character by the time they come to graduate school is utterly naive. I mean, they may have learned the basic things that their parents may have taught them or that they have learned uh, in early life about not lying, cheating, or stealing. Uh, but those are truths that everybody knows quite, quite obviously. And if, if you think that what we are about is to just reinforce those, then I'm not sure that that's really what character is about. Character is actually about saying, what will be your experience of, of power? What will be your experience of finding yourself in a situation where what you have to choose between is two wrongs? Uh, what will be the things that you have to worry about in terms of deciding between two goods? These far more complex choices are, in fact, the real determination of a leader's character. Uh, very few people, I think, you know, the obvious stuff that if you lie, cheat, or steal, everybody knows that that's going to be not something that people are going to recognize well. But why, why do people get, get themselves to that point? Uh, I, I don't think it's because you knew that their character was flawed as a teenager or as a child. In some cases, you might even discover that. But I have seen people who, quote, unquote, were uh, labeled as bad seeds. I think about my own friends growing up in college and what they've become uh, by the time they became 40-year-olds. They're dramatically different people, and I've seen people who you would have judged to be you know, of perfect character be seduced into doing things that are horrifying. So preparing people for, in fact, to get over this, that's why I was saying, this uh, almost exaggerated sense that they have, that my character is well known to me and is well formed and will be a true and clear guide to me. In fact, I think that's the greatest myth that we have to allow our students to overcome. Very to comment on that, I, I, you know, when I think about um, a lot of the students at Harvard Graduate School of Education, that you know, they have um, tremendous sense of purpose and passion. A lot of them, right? I mean, that's that is what I think unifies our students. Um, that's not quite the same as character, though, and I think that it's a perfect time, graduate school, the time when you're 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 engaging with your fellow classmates. And I tell them, you know, when you form a study group, make sure that you put people in your study group who you disagree with, who you don't have similar backgrounds with. You know, and it, because the tendency is just to kind of go along with people you know or people who are comfortable to you. But it's a perfect time. Then that's the time when you're faced with, you know, questioning about your own assumptions as you're debating a, you know, a situation or assignment question or a case. That's the time when you, that's, it's a perfect time. And it's a time for you to be able to reflect on your own practice, um, not just to take in the knowledge. You teach time. graduate students at Woodrow Wilson. And uh, do you feel that they've, in a, in a sense that, and, that, and then, uh, Monica, we're talking about, this is actually a good time 
as opposed to the argument which one often hears that by the time they get to graduate school, the basic character is formed and you can't really do much with it. No, I do think it's a good time, and I'll be very brief because there's several people who want to ask questions, but I do find that teaching MPAs or MPPs who have had some experience, not only through K through 12 and through college, but also after college, who come therefore with some greater perhaps humility about themselves at some level because they've lived more and they are less likely to have the wonderful undergraduate self-confidence that they can really take on the world, which I deeply treasure. But in some ways, it's easier to, to teach people who have had their character tested huh. and recognize what that means for them. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. We do have four people standing, uh, I believe. And so we'll try to get the, the deal with it fairly quickly with the questions on the floor. But then we'll, we'll end there if we could. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Max Tuckman, and I'm a joint degree between the business school and this lovely Kennedy School right here. I, uh, um, one of the reasons I'm standing here is because I looked around and realized that no females were asking questions, and so decided to take that upon myself and hope and encourage more women to get up and ask questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. So the question is, um, we talked a lot about gendered education and we talked a little bit about kind of the business school comments that are made and I, I totally agree. I feel that in the classroom right now where my comment is going to be discussed later or people, once I start speaking, I've noticed some men decide to tune out. Um, and I've been through so many workshops about how to be more aggressive as a female and how to jump in. But when do we start training our male counterparts? <laughs> To, to actually be more sensitive, to think more about our comments, to not disregard what we say. When do we start doing that? Well, we, it's, it's really a great question. We're doing a, a, I'm doing a report for Shirley Tillman at Princeton on undergraduate women's leadership and achievement. And one of the things we're finding in terms of academic achievement is that in the classroom, even with a sort of gender sensitive professor, men just speak up more quickly. I mean, guys, there's a question on the floor. Some guy will raise his hand. He'll talk. He may not even have thought very much about what he wants to say. He may not even have read the book for the day, but he has an idea, and he wants to get it out there. Women very rarely do that, and women are much more likely to take a little while to figure out whether what they're going to say sounds dumb or not dumb. So how do you do it? Then one of the things that people have said is, well, I don't know how this would work, and nobody has yet that I know tried it and told me, but so have a five second silence. Don't, I mean, it's so embarrassing for teachers to not have immediate answers to your questions, but take a sec, you know, a few seconds. Let everybody take a deep breath, and then maybe it will be more likely that guys will think more about what they are going to say and that a young woman will raise her hand. And you can also try to call more often on young women um, to give them a chance to feel they can put it forward. But you're right. I mean, guys have to recognize that the, the, the alpha male sort of sense that you're going to make it best if you get in there and make your statement first can be, um, can be a dissuading factor for other people in the room, men or often women, whose, whose personalities just don't work that way. And somebody needs to talk to them about it. Maybe they won't be dissuaded, but at least it can be raised. Please. Good evening. My name is Ghansham Tiwari. Uh, I'm a joint degree student at, uh, doing MBA at Kellogg School of Management and MPA here at Kennedy School. Uh, last year, I led a public leadership project in Bihar, which is the poorest state in India, where I worked with the chief minister of the state, who's known to be a phenomenal leader. Uh, and working in, in the masses, I somehow felt, uh, often reflected, that do, pe do poor people have a different view, a different framework to, to look at leadership? Is it, is it a framework which is less, uh, less articulate, uh, more engaged, uh, less uh, action, more interaction? So my question is that, that from you, do you think that poor have a different view of looking at leadership than what most of the developed world talks about? That's a really interesting question. And I'm, you may have thought more about this than I have. I have an answer, but you probably thought more about this than I have. You have an answer, go. I was going to say, I, I, don't know, I don't know that poor people look differently at leadership um, as a generic fact, but certainly people who haven't had the experiences that richer people often have had, because wealth, after all, buys opportunities. It buys travel and exposure and getting to know many different kinds of settings and is more likely to foster self-confidence. But I, I've been impressed by the numbers of 
of stories that I've heard of organizations like the Industrial Areas Foundation in poor cities like San Antonio, which takes as its major goal training people to be leaders, training very poor people to be leaders, and, and, and gives them all kinds of skills. And, and it's not as though they then look at leadership differently, but they come from different backgrounds and may want to use leadership for different purposes. And you have to reach out to them knowing that that is true. And it's different, perhaps, from the way you would teach a group of privileged students who have had everything in their lives, uh, because they will come with a different set of expectations. So it's not so much that poor people, in de by definition, look at leadership differently, but there may be different ways in which you bring them forward, train them, support them, and give them opportunities. Interesting. They also may have had different experiences. So yeah. when I think about, you know, International development, for example, I mean, the easy examples are, you know, the Americans coming in with the answer and doing this or that to the community as opposed to really, truly developing the community and bringing the leadership from within to actually implement and come up with doing a participatory needs assessment, come up with the solutions and then work together to implement them. And that's a very different approach. And I'm sure that, you know, throughout the world, the approach, their exposure to leadership has been something done unto them. Um, unfortunately, you know, in large urban districts, this is often sometimes the case, often the case, that we've got um, superintendents who are kind of rotating through. The average tenure is only a couple of years. So what happens is, and um, these can be very poor communities, and people also have the sense that there are solutions that are coming in and being done unto them and their expectations are raised and so forth and they have hope and then two years later when the programs start getting off the ground, guess what, the leadership shifts. And one um, superintendent described this to me as working with a wounded community and I thought that was so powerful to think about what it means then for the next person to come in and to work with that wounded community because the first thing you need to do is not exercise judgment and make decisions but it's to build back up that collective self-efficacy, which has been beaten down repeatedly over the years. Do you want to add anything to this? The, the only, uh, it's a great question, and I think this is one of those examples of uh, what you would say is part of where scholarship lags, the question that you've posed. Uh, my instinct is that people in, in those circumstances want to feel some connection with the person, so that it, it, more palpable emotional connection is going to be important for the leader. And the capacity to promise a sense of urgency. Uh, I think, at least based on my experiences in India, people who promise uh, action in a more urgent way tend to be more appealing. Uh, and certainly this is what I think has happened in Bihar, which is where you worked. I think it's clearly Nidish Kumar and various ways has been able to do both those things for the people in Bihar. Yeah, it was certainly the experience of Muhammad Yunus. Uh, with microfinance, uh, that uh, poor women who had never had a voice would sudden, would, when given the opportunity to build something of their own, became leaders of themselves. I mean, that's his whole microfinance, the, the Grameen Bank grew largely because a lot of poor women not only had money, but they became leaders. And, and he, it wasn't his staff that built it out, they built it out. Uh, but they, there was something that sort of uh, energized or electrified them and made a huge difference. Uh, and that, at least in that community. Yes, sir, please. My name is uh, Waj Khan, Wajad Khan. I'm uh, a fellow at the Schoenstein Center this year. Um, I'm from Pakistan. I'm a journalist. I have a question regarding uh, the plight of my particular country. Uh, we, uh, we've had a leadership crisis for six decades, uh, essentially. Uh, if we haven't killed our leaders, we've essentially voted them out. We have never voted back an incumbent government. Uh, in any election. Um, there's been outliers, there's been some, you know, I guess you can say positive actions. We voted in a woman, uh, the first Islamic country to do that. We also then oversaw her assassination. Um, so that sort of made up for that. Um, either ways, the question is that uh, this has been, with due respect, a very elite-driven discussion. Uh, knowing, doing, being, constituents, mobilization, it's very top-down sort of thing. And this is a follow-up to the, to the India question that uh, how about, what about communities like Pakistan, which have struggled between 
electing their leaders, as Dean Noria said, leaders are not people who declare themselves leaders, but who other declare leaders. We've done that, and we've failed. Obviously, I can't export or import rather 180 million people and put them in your class, David. That's not going to happen. I can't enroll them in the MPA on the MPP here with NAN either, nor in, uh, nor in Princeton. So the bottom line is that what do we do about this, this bottom-up approach? Is there a template in place? Because these people have been failed by leaders in uniform, out of uniform, in office, out of office. Uh, they have no other choice. Uh, their notion of leadership is now shifting fast to a very primordial basis of leadership. Western elites in suits who are bilingual are now seen as corrupt and not as these uh, operational new world leaders. They're seen as this, like, they're, they're seen as lackeys. Generals are seen as oppressive. And now they're going for the third type, which I'm not going to, you know, you, we all know who that is. So the idea is, what about bottom-up approaches? That's a really powerful question. Um, if I had a, an answer to that that was worthy of the question, yeah. I would feel very lucky and well informed. I guess I'm going to give an answer to a piece of your question, which is not, does not get at the basis of it. So how do you take a people who've had this debilitating, disillusioning experience over and over again of having leadership turnover, of having leaders betray people, whatever, or be assassinated? Um, I think the easy thing that happens sometimes in such periods in history, and I think of some periods before the revolution in France or whatever, is that, that people just get very cynical about leadership. And they are therefore open prey for someone who comes in who seems idealistic and, and, and supportive of them, but is actually going to distort their lives in ways that will not serve their interests. There's one tiny ray, white ray of hope which is not going to help exactly what you said, but it might help forestall all the kind of circumstance that you've described in other countries that are circling through the same problems. I don't know if you know Jim Fishkin's work on democratic deliberation, but what he's tried to do is say, look, it is very hard for a large population ever to arrive at any conception of the common interest. There's so many differences among us. People are so little informed. They go and vote or they, you know, just some emotional, erratic idea, or they don't vote at all. So what he's done is take random groups of citizens and has the money to support them being brought together for a day, being given information about a problem, water shortages, the environment, whatever it may be, and talking together about it and beginning to debate and discuss with one another, and then coming out at the end of the day with a recommendation for how you might best solve this. He's done it in China. He's done it in the American South. He's done it in re re relatively poor places, but not places that have exactly the experience you've described. But the main point he's showing is that if you take people and give them information and give them opportunities to help teach each other, they can then reach solutions that ought at some level to be taken as paradigmatic for other citizens who haven't been through this. And a good system would be one where we might be able to trust such little enclaves to come up with ideas so that we don't all have to have the same experience ourselves and that it would enrich our democracy. But that doesn't get at your problem. Two more. Yes, sir. Can I ask a question about uh, the call to leadership, the, the, the inner call to leadership? Uh, those of us in the audience who are 10, 15, 20, years away from our formal educations now are sort of stumbling upon opportunities for, for, for large scale leadership. And um, I wonder if the, if the panel um, feels that um, great leaders sort of know it in their inner core that they were meant to lead. Or if, you know, those of us who struggle with these issues um, and wonder, well, do we really maybe enjoy being a follower more than a leader. Um, have we done ourselves a, a, a disservice um, by um, not uh, choosing not to lead, you know, boards or divisions or even organizations, um, not finding out whether we have that capacity for leadership? Um, uh, have, we, have we done ourselves a disservice? Well, I tend to believe that there are 
there are situations and opportunities and context in which many different individuals could be leaders and that far fewer people in our society ever get to exercise those talents than would be possible if they had the right sort of encouragement or circumstances. But that doesn't mean absolutely everybody can be a leader, and it certainly doesn't mean everybody should be a leader in any circumstance. I remember one of my predecessors at President of Wellesley commented on an admissions application for a Wellesley student whose guidance counselor had written apologetically, you know, well, Mary is, um, she's not a leader, but she's a very good follower. And President Horton said, admit Mary by all means. We've got a class of 450 leaders. We need at least one follower. <laughs> because followers are an important part of the equation. And I mean, one, the chapter I had most fun writing in some ways was the leader follower chapter, because I'd never thought about that. And being a good follower, Aristotle says you learn how to lead through following. And there's a lot of truth to that. And being a good leader follower, because you're usually at the middle level of an organization. Very few people are at the very top or the very bottom. Or you may be a leader in one part of your life, in church, or in a volunteer, or a little league, or whatever, even if you're at the bottom of the heap at work. So I think there are many different ways in which people can lead. The only thing that I would question was the, the statement that you began your thoughtful question with, that good leaders somehow know it. I don't know how you would test that, because even good leaders sometimes have self-doubt and circumstances in which they don't do too well. Um, and I think m only the most prideful leaders have this sort of sense, or maybe those who have a, such a profound vocation, they've never questioned it, who just think, I know I'm a great leader from the inside. I haven't known many leaders who would honestly be able to say that. I'm guessing by your asking this question that you are curious yourself. I mean, by asking that question, that just strikes me as, you're kind of looking for the right spot. Or one is looking for the right spot, maybe not you. But I like this kind of idea of the leader-follower kind of cycle, that we learn how to lead by following. And rather than looking for the exact perfect position, maybe I need to follow a little bit. Maybe I need to watch the role models, watch the people around me, and they, then maybe with some assistance and taking a step and taking another step, I can find a good place to lead. And the other part of Aristotle's statement on this that does go back to the question that you asked, sorry, uh, your, our Pakistani colleague, was that people, in a, best, in a healthy system, people will rule and be ruled in turn. So once you've learned how to lead through following and you get in a position of leadership or rulership, the problem is, and this is what I address in the chapter on democracy, the problem is people like to hold on to power. People don't like to give it up for a lot of different psychological reasons. And so it is really important to have a system that, is, that gives easy ways out of power and requires people to step down if you're not going to have their perks and their privileges ossified so that they become so much more unequal than others. So ruling and being ruled in turn. And if you know you're going to have to go back to the ordinary citizenry, then you're going to be less likely to abuse your power or to suddenly believe yourself to be a god. So what you're asking, I think, about your country is how, how does one get to a situation where that's the expectation, that people will rule and be ruled in turn? And that's a very hard thing for people to, to accomplish. Last question. I, my name is Edward Lushenko. I'm a co-founder and president-elect of the Harvard Club of Ukraine. Leadership and public leadership are quintessential for overcoming the global financial crisis which we have. And world economic uh, forum, you know, which is behind the Davos meeting, you know, is establishing a new three-year program. It's called Executive Master of Global Leadership with four leading universities and business schools. So do you think, you know, it is a possibility or a day will come, you know, where Harvard Kennedy School also is going to introduce a new degree called Master of Public Leadership? That's you or Nitin. Go ahead. Yeah. Dean well, we're actually, this is a good moment. I've been wondering about your reflections as you were here. Why don't you stand? I, I think it is inappropriate to comment from the audience. Oh. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing the panel's views whether such would be a good idea. I, uh, I've been struck by the program that uh, the graduate school of education has started. 
and that Monica is so involved with, and the, the dean is here, uh, that it's, it's, and the number of people who have applied for it, uh, does, it seems to me it's something that we ought to be following with great interest in other schools. Uh, and particularly the combination of teaching uh, or classroom activity and practice uh, is something that we all ought to be, you know, watching to see how this begins to turn out. Uh, Dean Elwood uh, is being too modest. He actually has thought, has been, has, as I've said earlier, been encouraging conversations about sort of how one, uh, how one could combine practice. Uh, but it's also true, as you, I think, know or may know, uh, that we have in, uh, growing bonds uh, with the World Economic Forum and the young leaders who are coming through the program uh, there that uh, Dean uh, Noria has been involved with in the past. Uh, so we have, for example, at the end of uh, this month, we have a group of young global leaders uh, coming here. Uh, we'll probably have 60 or 70 from around the world uh, coming for a 10-day uh, program uh, that is, has been very, very well received by them. And they're talking to us about uh, working with social entrepreneurs as a potential program. Uh, Harvard did consider uh, a few years ago the idea of, of joining in a master's degree program with other universities related to this. And one of the real issues that the board had to consider, and Nam, you may have been on the board, was whether there was some view that Harvard would grant a degree, but people would actually study somewhere else, and there was a real resistance to that, and I think appropriately so, on the part of the board at that time. But these are not, these are not, these are, you know, we're in the midst of a series of conversations. Whether they would lead to a master's in public leadership, I think is a different, is a, beyond where a lot of the conversation is now, but how we internationalize how we ensure that our students here, whether they're American or from other countries, have these more global perspectives, how we uh, come to appreciate multiple perspectives that Nan writes about is I think something that's very much on our minds. When you have an essentially American located university with an American, very largely an American faculty, how do you really move beyond so that we can understand and have the kind of conversation about Pakistan uh, in ways that uh, we should. I, I think there's some very exciting things going on at this university right now in this field. And uh, I think what you find in, in, in the two deans that were here in the Graduate School of Education School uh, and, and the Kennedy School as well as the School of Business uh, is a, a ferment around these questions. I'm not sure where they'll go, but I do know that, Nan, you very much advanced the conversation. Uh, tonight, your book. We we celebrate your book. Uh, it's so good to have someone who's who brings this intellectual depth and understanding that you bring to the questions of leadership. It just it's so rare, and it's uh, we're just very appreciative of of you writing a book, and we're very appreciative of your service to this university uh, and to the younger generation, as you have done in so many other institutions. Uh, uh, Nitin uh, and Monica, thank you both. This has been a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you all. Thank Good night. You thank, you. thank you for reading the book so carefully. I'm really proud. Thank you, David. Thank you.